In the last video, we analyzed and solved this Potsdam problem from 2011, asking us to figure out for which dimension of the square matrices does there exist a matrix with integer entries, such that if you take a dot product of a row with itself, you get an even number, whereas if you take a dot product of two different rows, you get an odd number. And a natural follow-up question we had to this question is whether if the rows of a matrix has this property, then the columns do as well. So to rephrase the follow-up question, so let me erase all of this. So our question was, suppose we are given an n by n matrix with integer entries, and our question was, can we then say the same thing about the columns? Before we get started on this question, let me remind you of a, maybe a couple of things that we discussed in the last video. And if you have not watched the last video, I encourage you to check it out first, and it's going to be linked in the description. The first thing I want to turn your attention to is that to allow ourselves to work under the nice vector space and just focus on the parity of the integers given, we can work inside the vector space z mod 2 to the n. And of course, I hasten to add that the ground field is of course just z mod 2. And the second thing that I wanted to remember from the last video, and this is critical, was that we proved that, that n has to be odd. If you do not remember what goes wrong when n is even, or if you have never watched the last video, once again, I encourage you to check it out. Uh, in this video, however, we're just going to focus on n being odd, because of course that we proved that in the last video. To be precise, we proved that n being odd is in fact a sufficient condition in the last video, and the example that we gave was the matrix with zeros on the diagonal, so 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0 and 1 everywhere else. And this worked because if you take a dot product of a row with itself, you're going to be adding an even number once, getting you 0, so you do indeed get an even number. And if you take a dot product of two different rows, then other than these two overlaps between zeros and ones, you're going to get an odd number of ones out of it. So you're going to get a one when you take a dot product of two different rows. So this works out perfectly. Now, something that I did not point out in the last video, at least explicitly, was that you can really permute, permute each row in this matrix in the same way, and the resulting matrix should definitely work as well. Because for example, if you just shift entries of each row, mod 5, so if you just rotate each row, I'm simply rotating each row by one unit, and the dot product of any two rows is going to stay the same. Because when you take a dot product of these two rows, you're multiplying like this and adding them up, and you're still multiplying the same pairs of entries as before. What this is telling us is that if we give this matrix a name, say A, then A does not have to be symmetric. Certainly the most Natural example, perhaps, that we gave in the last video was symmetric, but by just permuting it, you get a matrix that's not symmetric. Now, of course, the one of the reasons we raised this question in the first place was because for this natural matrix, the answer to the question, can the same be said about the columns, is yes. The reason it's yes is by the same reasoning we made on the rows. If you just look at two columns, you can simply just make the same reasoning we did before. So I think one way of trying to get some evidence on whether the answer to this follow-up question is yes or no is to actually try to construct such an A that looks very, very different from this matrix to the extent that you can't even get it by simply permuting the rows in the same way. And is that possible? Well, let's actually try it out. Let's actually try out 5 by 5 case and see if we can get any, any insights on how to approach this question. So to entirely avoid the matrix that we found in the last video, let's actually try putting two ones rather than four ones. And maybe for the next one, you can overlap a pair of one like this. So when you take the dot product with these two, you get a one. And for the next one, another possibility is to try something like this. So thanks to these overlapping triple of ones, if you take a dot product of any two rows, you get a one. And for the next one, you can put zero, one, zero, zero, one. But it seems like in the last row, it may be game over. Because if you try doing the same thing, put a 1 here, then where is the second one going to go? You put the second one here, then you're going to get an overlap with this row. And when you take the dot product, you're going to get a 0. And similar arguments apply no matter where you put the second one. So it seems like we have to just retrace and do everything again until 
until it hits us that you can really use 4 ones in the final row. As long as we're not using 4 ones in every single row, we are still getting a pretty different matrix out of this. So why don't we try something like 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, and it's not hard to see that this matrix works. Now, before we get too excited and declare this as a counterexample, let's actually check columns. First of all, every column has an even number of ones. So if you take a dot product of a column with itself, you get a zero. So we don't get a violation there. If you consider two different columns, ah, oh, wait a bit, this still seems to work. Because you take, for example, dot product of this one and this one, you have these ones overlapping and nothing else, and you get a one. Ah, and you can check other pairs as well, as you wish, but it's not hard to see that this matrix actually works. So by this point, we have probably resigned ourselves and the answer may actually be yes. So that may be our conjecture. Of course, we may still find some kind of counterexample onward, but it seems like even if we change the matrix quite a bit, the answer remains to be yes. One way that we can try to progress forward is to remember from the previous video that we found that if you take, then when you take A times A transpose, you get this pathological matrix no matter what. If you forgot how the proof went, remember that if V1 all the way to Vn were the row vectors of the matrix, then if you take, then if you multiply this by the transpose, then we get this n by n version of this matrix. Because if you take, for example, v1.v1, you get a 0, and if you take v1.v2, you get a 1, etc. And once we realize this, we see that we can really rephrase this entire question. Rather than asking the question as it is, we can really say, if A times A transpose gets us this matrix, which we can call, for example, identity reversed. So here, reversed means we're switching zeros and ones. So we had the identity matrix and we're simply switching zeros and ones to get the identity reversed. And really the question that we're asking here is that whether A times A transpose being identity reversed implies that if we just start out with rows and columns switched, those A transpose times A also get us the identity reversed. So we can really rephrase the entire question as such. But this may not be a much of a simplification, like how do we proceed? Well, it may seem like this is a, this is a worthless observation until, until we recall that if B times B transpose, so let me just use B for an arbitrary matrix, got us the identity, so here B is n by n, so B is an n by n square matrix, and if you t multiply the two and you got the identity matrix, then it certainly implies that B transpose times B is the identity matrix. If you took linear algebra, you probably have seen the proof of this one, because if B times B transpose gets us the identity, that means B has to have rank N, meaning that B is in fact invertible. And because B is invertible, we know by multiplying by B inverse to the left of both sides, we get B transpose is equal to B inverse, and because of that, this has to be satisfied. Now, knowing this, so we know this thing to be true, can we somehow prove this statement to be true? And this seems hard until we realize that if you take reverse of the identity reversed, then you are back to the identity. So can we somehow take advantage of that? Can we maybe try taking reverse of A times A transpose and try to finish the problem? So if A times A transpose is I reversed, can we actually take reverse of the individual matrices in the equation? Does this imply A reverse times A reverse transpose is the identity. So I'm asking if you take the reverse of the entire A times A transpose, do we actually get this matrix, given that A times A transpose was equal to identity reversed? Now, something to realize, and this may be something to get excited for, is that once we prove this, we are done. Because once we prove this thing to be true, then we know A reverse transpose times A reverse should be the identity. So applying, applying this lemma again gets us that A transpose times A is the identity reversed, and this is exactly the conclusion that we want to arrive at. So once we prove this implication, we are actually done, and this seems much more manageable. So let's actually try this out. Your A has A, B, C, D, E as the first row, and F, G, H, I, G as the second row, and you're multiplying it by A transpose, and we're getting the identity reversed out of this. Now, we're using five rows and columns, but we will make sure that our argument should apply whenever n is odd. 
Now remember that if you just focus on one single row, then there should be even number of odd numbers there. There should be even ones, which means there should be odd number of zeros. And this is because when you take a dot product with itself, you want to get zero out of it. Doing this, we know that if you take reverse of A, we are going to have odd ones and even zeros because the zeros and ones are going to switch. So we know if you multiply A reverse and A transpose reversed, so if you just reverse the two matrices that we were multiplying, then we should actually get ones on the diagonal. So doing this should get us ones on the diagonal because each row in A reverse actually has an odd number of ones. Now realize that A transpose reverse and A reverse transpose are the same because switching rows and columns and switching zeros and ones, those two operations should definitely commute. So we can just focus on looking at A reverse A transpose reverse rather than A reverse A reverse transpose. So we have ones on the diagonal, but really what's not obvious is whether we should have zeros everywhere else. We know that if you took a dot product of two different rows, so A, B, C, D, E, and F, G, H, I, G, di plus eg is actually a 1. Now our question is, if you switch zeros and 1s here and here, and you take a dot product, do we now get a 0? First of all, realize that switching zeros and 1s can simply be accomplished by just adding 1 to every entry. Because if you add 0 to 1, you get a 1. If you add 1 to 1, you get a 0, mod 2. So you can simply add 1 to every entry. And now let's try taking a dot product and see what we get. Take a dot product and we're going to get things like a plus 1 times f plus 1 plus b plus 1 times g plus 1, etc. Now, you multiply it out and add them up. We are definitely going to get af plus bg plus ch plus di plus eg. And we are also going, and we are also going to get individual letters a, f, b, g, etc. So we are going to get so we're going to get a plus b plus c plus d plus e, etc. And finally, we're going to have a bunch of ones. We're going to have plus one, plus one, and so on. How many ones are we going to have? Well, our matrix is odd by odd. So we should have an odd number of ones. So we should have an extra plus one at the end. So looking at this, we know this entire thing is a one. So that's going to cancel out with this one to get us a zero. So our entire dot product now is a plus b plus c plus d plus so on. Now, what is this going to be? Well, let's remember. That, let's remember that if you look at the first row or the second row of A, you have an even number of 1s. So we know A plus B plus C plus D plus E should be a 0. You, we know F plus G plus H plus I plus G should be a 0. And that's exactly what we have. We have two of them. And each one is 0. So we do indeed get a 0. So in fact, we get 0 in every other entry as desired. So we have indeed proven, we have indeed proven that this works, meaning that this holds as well by our previous argument, and we conclude that the answer to this entire extended question is yes.